everyone. I hope you're doing well. Today's video is on Kitty Genovese. Viewer discretion is advised. The Legend of Kitty Genovese. In 1964, New York City was a dangerous place. No less than 636 murders would occur in the city that year, but only one would catch the attention of the entire nation. The callous indifference of the witnesses to this gruesome crime would highlight what many perceived as urban decay, the evilness and moral decline of the city and society. Its impact would reverberate across decades and change the way we access emergency assistance forever. Born July 7, 1934, Catherine Susan Genovese was known affectionately as Kitty. Kitty was the oldest of five children raised in the Park Slope area of Brooklyn. Bright and likable, Kitty was voted class cut-up at Prospect Heights High School. Life was quiet in the most Italian-American community for the growing family. But New York was rapidly changing. In 1954, Kitty's mother, Rachel, would witness a murder that prompted the family to move out of the city, seeking safety in Connecticut. To her mother's dismay, Kitty would stay behind. Now 19 years old, the petite young woman had recently graduated from high school and was engaged, with her wedding date fast approaching. Kitty was forging her own path, though most weekends she would journey to her family's home in Connecticut. By the end of 1954, the brief marriage would be annulled, and Kitty was once again on her own. Determined and independent, Kitty would drift through a series of jobs over the next few years. Bored with clerical positions, Kitty accepted a position as a bartender and found the excitement she was searching for. Kitty began taking bets on horse racing from the bar patrons and was arrested for bookmaking in 1961. Kitty lost her job. This arrest would generate Kitty's most famed photograph. Kitty bounced back quickly, taking a bartending position at Ev's 11th Hour Bar in Hollis, Queens. Kitty was a hard worker and ambitious. She worked double shifts trying to save money to open her own Italian restaurant. Soon she was managing the bar. Kitty found a new love in Mary Ann Zalonko, though only a few people knew Kitty was gay. It was illegal at that time. Kitty would also move into a new apartment in March 1963 in a quiet two-story, two-door style building near the village called Kew Gardens. Mary Ann would soon join Kitty in the apartment at 8267 Austin Street. Even more than 50 years later, Mary Ann would remember those days as the happiest of her life. For a while, Kitty's life was again peaceful. Around 3 a.m., the morning of Friday, March 13, 1964, 28-year-old Kitty was finally off work and making her own way home in her sporty red Fiat convertible. It was her and Mary Ann's first anniversary, and she was eager to get home. Faithfully, 29-year-old Winston Mosley was restless that night. An African-American business machine operator, the married father lived a secret life after dark while his wife worked nights as a nurse. Cruising the streets, he was searching for a victim. As Kitty stopped at a red light on Hoover Street, Mosley took notice. She was just what he had been searching for, a woman, alone. Mosley made a U-turn and followed her home. Unaware of her pursuer, Kitty would park her car on the Long Island Railroad lot adjacent to the Kew Gardens building. Mosley parked his white Chevy... Corvair just down the street. Kitty was merely a hundred feet from the safety of her home. As she locked her car and began walking to the entrance of her building, Kitty would observe a man waiting at the edge of the lot. This man alarmed her, and though the entrance to her apartment was behind the building, Kitty swiftly decided to walk up Austin Street instead, towards Lefferts Boulevard, where a call box that connected to the 102nd police precinct stood. Mosley ran after her. He caught up to Kitty in front of a bookstore. Quickly, he stabbed her two to three times in the back with a large, serrated hunting knife. Oh my God, he stabbed me. Help me, Kitty screamed. These first wounds were not fatal. 
However, it was a cold and dark night, and with windows closed, though many heard Kitty's cries, it was difficult to see what was happening in the street below. Across the street, from the seventh floor of the Morbray apartment building, Robert Moser opened his window and spotted what seemed to him to be a lover's quarrel. He shouted, let that girl alone. Get out of there. Spooked, Mosley ran away, leaving Kitty staggering as she tried to make her way home. Unaware Kitty was seriously injured, Mr. Moser went back to bed, thinking the incident was finished. Also in the Mowbray, Joseph Fink, the night elevator operator, had a clear view of the first attack and watched from the lobby. He knew Kitty had been stabbed. Briefly, Fink considered getting his baseball bat, but instead he went to his basement apartment and took a nap. Kitty was soon out of sight of the initial witnesses as she clung to the building, making her way back to the entrance. Though many did hear a commotion and screams, few saw the first attack on Kitty and did not see her injuries. Like Moser, they dismissed the noises as a lover's or drunken quarrel spilling over from the nearby Old Bailey's Bar. At least two residents did call the police to report the first disturbance. Samuel Huffman stated to the dispatcher that a woman had been beat up but got up and was staggering around. Hattie Grund also heard someone shout for help and saw Kitty, alone, in front of the dry cleaners, but didn't realize that Kitty was wounded. She called the police to report the incident and was told by the officer who answered that they had already received other calls. None of these reports were given high priority by the police department. Meanwhile, Winston Mosley ran back to his car. The assault was seemingly over, but Mosley's need was not yet satisfied. For roughly 10 minutes, Mosley waited. No police cars or ambulances were responding. No help was imminent. With renewed confidence, Mosley changed his hat, moved his car to a more secluded location, and went back for Kitty. By this time, Kitty had made her way to the back of the Kew Gardens building, opened the entrance to the apartments. In terrible pain and losing blood, Kitty collapsed in the foyer. This is where Mosley discovered Kitty again. Now off the street and out of sight, he began stabbing and slashing brutally at Kitty. At some point, Mosley would sexually assault the seriously wounded Kitty. Kitty tried to fight back, screaming for help, her black leather gloves shredded by the blade, at the top of the stairs, Kitty and Mary Ann's friend and neighbor, Carl Ross, had heard the screams from the first attack, but, frightened, he did not look out his window. He waited as the noises stopped. Now, the screams were much closer. Ross would pace by his door, debating what to do, but as the altercation dragged on, he finally cracked open his door. At the foot of the stairs, he saw his friend Kitty, lying on her back, trying to speak to him as Mosley continued to stab her. Mosley looked up and made eye contact with Ross. Terrified, Ross retreated to his apartment once more. For reasons known only to Carl Ross, he did not call the police immediately. Instead, he rang his girlfriend, who urged him not to get involved. He then climbed out of his apartment window to reach a neighbor in the building to ask their advice. News of the attack would quickly spread through Kew Gardens, finally reaching Sophie Ferrara, a mother in her 30s with young children. Though Kitty's first screams had awakened Sophie, her husband and son, they hadn't seen anything amiss when they looked out their window. Now, upon hearing her friend was injured, the small woman did not hesitate to race to find Kitty, not knowing if the attacker was still present. Running down a dark alley in her nightclothes, Sophie found Kitty in the foyer and had to force the door open. Mosley was gone, having stolen $49 from Kitty's purse as she lay dying. The area was sprayed with so much blood, Sophie would slip and struggle to reach her friend. Kitty was still alive as Sophie cradled her in her arms. Sophie screamed for Ross to call the police. Finally, Ross dialed the station. It was 3.55 a.m. and too late to save Kitty's life. Kitty died in Sophie's arms. Mary Ann slept through the attack and would be woken to come and identify her girlfriend in the morgue. She would endure hours of interrogation by the police before she was allowed to return home. Out of respect for Kitty, she didn't reveal the true nature of their relationship. Instead, she grieved in private. Five days later, Winston Mosley was caught attempting to burglarize a home in Queens. 
Not recognizing the man going into his neighbor's home, Mr. Clear called after Mosley, who then took off. In stark contrast to the events of March 13th, Mr. Clear gave chase, tackling Mosley and holding him until the police arrived. At the police station, an alert detective thought Mosley matched the description of Kitty Genovese's killer. However, Mosley was a slight, unassuming man with no criminal record. Could he really be the monster they were searching for? It wouldn't take long to find out. When questioned, Mosley coolly admitted to committing 30 to 40 burglaries in the area for which he had never been caught. He confessed to at least eight rapes, becoming increasingly more violent as he avoided apprehension. Then he casually confessed to Kitty's murder and the rape and murder of Annie Mae Johnson, age 24, on February 29th, two weeks prior to Kitty's attack. Johnson had been shot, raped, and was still alive when Mosley set her and her home on fire. And the murder of 15-year-old Barbara Krolick the previous July, for which police had already arrested and charged someone. When asked why, Mosley stated simply that he wanted to kill a woman. The original story of Kitty's murder garnered barely four paragraphs in the New York Times in the first days after her death. But two weeks later, the Times would publish a story that rocked the nation and launched Kitty's name into infamy. Ten days after Kitty's murder, legendary Times meteor editor Abe Rosenthal would have lunch with New York City Police Commissioner Michael Murphy. Towards the end of their lunch, Rosenthal asked about the curious case of two men who confessed to the murder of Barbara Kralik. Commissioner Murphy remarked that one of those men had definitely murdered Kitty Genovese and he was struck by the details surrounding that crime. Brother, he said, that Queen story is one for the books. For more than 30 minutes, Kitty had been attacked multiple times, screaming and pleading for help, and 38 of her neighbors did nothing to help her. The commissioner explained. Rosenthal returned to his office that afternoon and assigned the story to Martin Gadensburg. On March 27, 1964, the New York Times would run a front page article. 37 who saw a murder didn't call the police. Apathy at stabbing of Queen's woman shook inspector. The headline screamed, mistyping 37 for 38. The article began, for more than half an hour, 38 respectable, law-abiding citizens in Queens watched a killer stalk and stab a woman in three separate attacks in Kew Gardens. Twice the sound of their voices and the sudden glow of their bedroom lights interrupted him and frightened him off. Each time he returned, sought her out, and stabbed her again. One unnamed witness in the article, when asked why he didn't act, notoriously responded, I didn't want to get involved. This first in-depth article was fraught with mistakes and inaccuracies, but it garnered the reaction Rosenthal had hoped for, and the legend surrounding Kitty's violent death was born. Only months before, President Kennedy had been assassinated and the country was still raw. This portrayal of Kitty's murder and the callous circumstances it detailed further appalled a traumatized nation. Rosenthal would further capitalize on this outrage with his quickly published book, 38 Witnesses, which reaffirmed the misstatements in the original article. Additional articles and news stories explored the same question. How could 38 people watch as a young woman was stalked, stabbed, and murdered for over 30 minutes and not at least call the police? The country was in shock, and the story was far from over. Only months later, Mosley would plead insanity at his trial. A psychiatrist found Mosley to have tendencies towards necrophilia and psychopathy, but it was not legally insane. The jury rejected his plea and on June 11, 1964, found him guilty. The nation's outrage was evident when the courtroom erupted in applause as Mosley was sentenced to death in the electric chair. This will be reduced to 20 years to life in prison after New York abolished the death penalty in 1967. He was only ever charged with Kitty's murder. Mosley's life in prison would be far from dull. On March 18, 1968, Mosley escaped in Buffalo, New York while being transported back to Attica Prison after receiving treatment for a self-inflicted injury. Mosley fled to a nearby vacant home 
where he hid for three days until the owners, Matthew and Janet Kulaga, returned on March 21st. Armed with the gun he'd stolen during his escape, Mosley tied up the couple and held them captive for several hours. He then raped Janet Kaluga in front of her bound husband. Afterwards, Mosley would flee to the home with the Kulaga's car, driving to Grain Island, where he then broke into another home, taking a mother and daughter hostage. By now, the police were on his trail and tracked Mosley to the Grain Island home, where he released the mother and daughter and surrendered without incident. Two additional 15-year sentences would be added to his punishment. In 1971, Mosley took part in the Attica prison riots. Then, in 1977, Mosley earned a bachelor's degree in sociology. Mosley would be denied parole 18 times before he died in prison on March 28, 2016. He was 81 years old and served almost 52 years. He was one of the prison's longest-serving inmates. The generally accepted version of Kitty's murder would inspire a new field of research in psychology as individuals tried to make sense of the tragedy. The bystander effect, sometimes referred to as Kitty Genovese syndrome, became a long-standing area of discussion and research. Still taught in college psychology courses and referenced on television, and in new stories to this day. The bystander effect, generally speaking, is described as a social phenomenon in which individuals may be less likely to intervene or offer to help a victim when other people are present, thinking others may help instead. Though the bystander effect exists, was it responsible for Kitty's death? The Genovese family was destroyed by Kitty's murder. They did not attend Mosley's trial and instead avoided all discussion of what really happened to Kitty. It was just too painful. Her family believed Kitty died alone, not just at the hands of Winston Mosley, but also as a direct result of 38 witnesses who were fully aware of her attack and did nothing to help her. William Bill Genovese was just 16 years old when his older sister was murdered. Even he didn't question the narrative of the apathetic 38 witnesses until much later in his life. Haunted by this account of Kitty's murder, Bill vowed to be the opposite of indifferent. After graduating high school two years later, at a time when other young men were trying to avoid the draft, Bill enlisted in the Marines and was sent to fight in the Vietnam War. He would not be a bystander. At just 19 years old, Bill was a few months into his tour when a landmine would detonate. Bill lost both his legs above the knee. Bill returned home, married, and had a family. But he and his siblings did not discuss Kitty. Instead, they avoided all media surrounding it and strove to shield their heartbroken mother from all conversation of Kitty. After the death of their mother, Rachel, in 1992, and yet another parole hearing for Mosley, Bill began to ask questions and became obsessed with learning about his beloved sister's final hours. In 2004, the New York Times would revisit their notorious story to mark the 40th anniversary of Kitty's death, and it was admitted to the mistakes it first published as truth. This sparked further fixation in Bill. Soon, Bill would meet filmmaker James Solomon and embark on an 11-year odyssey to uncover the truth about Kitty's murder. The result is a documentary entitled The Witness. Bill would learn that the New York Times and Abe Rosenthal were highly regarded at the time, and few questioned their account of Kitty's murder. Though often repeated, no one is certain where the number 38 came from though Bill speculates that it was an innocent clerical error. The police blotter from that evening had 38 entries, but not were all witnesses. There is no evidence that 38 people watched or knew that Kitty was being murdered and refused to assist her. While many people heard Kitty's screams, only two people were confirmed to have actually witnessed the attack itself. Carl Ross, who would have Ultimately, but too late, call the police and Joseph Fink, the night elevator operator at the Mall Bray. Only Fink would see the stabbing and blatantly choose to ignore Kitty's pleas. Bill would also discover that Kitty was gay, a fact that he and his family had no idea about. Mary Ann was always referred to as Kitty's roommate, even though she would accompany Kitty occasionally on her visits to Connecticut. Kitty was ambient about her sexuality, and out of love for Kitty and her memory, Mary Ann kept the relationship quiet. Most pointedly, Bill would meet Sophie Ferrer, 
Until beginning his quest for the truth, Bill learned that his sister was not alone when she died. She was, in fact, at the arms of a close friend who risked her own safety to reach Kitty and would comfort her as Kitty took her last breaths. The legend of Kitty Genovese and the apathetic witnesses who failed her would inspire not just the field of psychology, but change the law and emergency response. The push for a centralized emergency response system had begun years before Kitty's murder. But her death in the aftermath of her story is credited as the catalytic for the implementation of the National 911 Emergency Number in 1968. Many hoped its enactment would prevent future tragedies and would encourage witnesses to seek help for victims in a way they never could before. Prior to the introduction of 911, individuals would dial zero to have an operator connect them to the nearest police or fire station, or other people could look up the number of the station in a phone book, either way losing precious response time. Kitty's legend would also be the catalytic of what was known as Good Samaritan Laws. These laws, though they vary greatly, generally protect an individual from prosecution if they voluntarily provide aid or assistance to someone they perceive to be in danger or distress. The intent is to inspire more people to act rather than avoid. Situations like Kitty's attack, safe in the knowledge they won't be held legally responsible if they make a mistake. Kitty's legacy would also inspire the creation of various neighborhood watch programs. Ultimately, Bill learned that the legend surrounding his sister's murder, the story that would affect many more lives, was not accurate. No, Kitty did not die alone, surrounded by apathetic witnesses who did nothing to help her. But her story and the myth that grew around it shook people all across the country and helped to transform how we respond to those in need. Thank you for watching today's video. If you liked the video, please give me a thumbs up. And if you would like to see more videos like this, please subscribe. What paranormal or crime-related mystery would you like to see next? I hope you all have a great day.